Hi everybody, I am that nursing prof and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be discussing gestational diabetes. So what is that? What is gestational diabetes? Gestational diabetes is any sort of glucose intolerance first seen during pregnancy. So if you've had it before, when you're not pregnant, that's just regular diabetes, okay? Gestational diabetes is when we don't show those signs and symptoms until we're pregnant. What happens in normal pregnancy is that our glucose increases, as it should, right, because we're taking in 300 more um, calories a day, right? So our glucose naturally increases, and our body reacts to that by increasing our insulin. In gestational diabetes, something goes wrong, okay? So it doesn't increase the insulin, it doesn't notice there's more glucose in the body, and it doesn't act the way it's supposed to. So, some signs and symptoms. These are gonna look really familiar to you because this is very, very similar to just regular old diabetes, right? So, fatigue, blurry vision, extreme thirst, nausea, and then frequent urination. Now, what's special about these is, look at what they are. How many of these are normal pregnancy things, right? Fatigue is normal in pregnancy. Thirst, nausea, maybe morning sickness, and frequent urination. All of those happen in normal pregnancy anyway. So this might not be something they notice right away. Who's at risk for gestational diabetes? Anybody who's overweight or obese? women of advanced maternal age, which is over the age of 35. If they have a history of gestational diabetes, this has happened before, it's more likely to happen again. If they have multiples, twins, triplets, quads, you know, the more babies in there, the higher your risk. And if they have a poor diet, so if they eat a lot of unhealthy foods, they are at risk for gestational diabetes. Who gets screened for gestational diabetes? Everybody! Everybody does, not just those at-risk people. Every pregnant woman will get screened for gestational diabetes during her pregnancy, usually between 24 and 28 weeks. So the initial glucose challenge, sometimes they call it the glucose tolerance test, sometimes people just call it the one-hour test. That's what they're talking about, okay? So it's done between 24 and 28 weeks, and it takes an hour. So they give you the substance, they give you that um, glucose containing substance. It doesn't really taste like anything, or you can get it flavored actually. Uh, it's not that big of a deal. You drink it, you wait an hour, and then they check. And if your blood sugar results are greater than 140, then you need follow-up testing. So this is not enough to diagnose you. So if you get this initial test done and you have a, a bad result, they're not gonna say like, well, that's it, you got it. We're, you have gestational diabetes. They're gonna say, okay, this is proof that we need some follow-up testing done. So what does follow-up testing look like? It looks very similar, right? Um, the patient is to fast overnight, and then they're gonna get the one hour, they're gonna drink the stuff again. Um, they're gonna get it done at one hour, two hours, and three hours. So we're doing it three times. If two of these three results come back high, then doctor usually can go ahead and diagnose you with gestational diabetes. And this may happen more than once. Most patients who have gestational diabetes are able to monitor it at home, so a lot of our nursing care is gonna revolve around teaching and education. When they are in the hospital or the clinic setting, there are some things we could do. One thing, of course, checking their blood sugars. Of course we wanna do that. We wanna know those numbers. And then checking baby's well-being, so we could do a non-stress test, which is where we hook mom up to the monitor, and we listen for baby's heart rate, and we see if mom is having any contractions. And then we could do a biophysical profile, if she comes into like, you know, the clinic or something like that. And if you're not sure what a biophysical profile is, I did do a video on it. I'll put it in the thing, and then I'll put it in the description box if you want to check that out. So what I said before about focusing on teaching, that's going to be our main goal. So what are we going to be teaching? Well, first, we're going to be teaching them how to take their own blood sugar at home. The importance of diet and exercise. And this is key. The majority of women who are diagnosed with gestational diabetes will never need to take insulin. Okay? The majority of them are managed through diet and exercise. Stress management techniques, because of course, when your stress goes up, 
your blood sugar goes up. Infection control, because they are at higher risk of getting an infection. If they are to give insulin to themselves, we need to teach them how to do that, so insulin injection. And then we want them to weigh themselves at home. And just keep a record of it. If they notice any excessive weight gain over a period of time, you know, that's, it's not their appointment for a while, they should call in and tell us about that. But we do weigh them at every appointment as well. So those are our big, you know, nursing interventions for this patient population. Self-monitored a lot of times, so lots of teaching and education. When it comes to complications, we have maternal and then the baby complications. When it comes to mom, she is at risk for giving birth to a preterm infant. She's at risk for preeclampsia. So if you watched my preeclampsia video, you could see one of the risk factors for that was diabetes. Now one is blood sugar and one is blood pressure, but oftentimes people can have both at the same time. And no one wants that, who wants that, right? So keeping an eye out for that as well. And then type two diabetes. I think the statistic right now is like 60% of women who get gestational diabetes will get type two diabetes later in life. So if you as the nurse can do really good patient teaching right now, Hopefully, we can prevent them from having type 2 diabetes later in life. When it comes to babies' complications, they have macrosomia on that list. So macrosomia is like being a really big baby, okay? And the thing about babies is they shouldn't ever be too big. Too little, not healthy. Too big, also not healthy, okay? One big risk factor for being a big baby is having something called a shoulder dystocia. So if mom gives birth vaginally to a very large baby, and sometimes to not a large baby, this happens too, but usually um, the baby is very big, it gets stuck, okay? And there's lots of complications related to a shoulder dystocia. You could have a brachial plexus injury, a palsy, permanent nerve damage to the baby. So we want to avoid that happening if we possibly can. Hypoglycemia after delivery. This is something we screen for aggressively on these patients, on these infants. So if mom had type 1, type 2, or gestational diabetes, if the baby is really big, our macrosomia babies, or really tiny, our little ones, um, we are going to be doing blood sugars on this baby until we know that they're safe and they're at an adequate, um, stable level. Why? Because insulin, mom's insulin that she was making while she was pregnant, did not cross the placenta. The fetus was making their own insulin in response to mom's high, high levels of glucose. So this baby has been making these high levels of insulin, you know, its whole gestation. Now it's born, it's out, it's still making those because it doesn't know any better yet, but it's not getting the high glucose it was getting before because maybe it's breastfeeding or it's bottle feeding. It's not eating as much as it was before, which is normal but it's still making that high levels of insulin. So the baby needs to learn how to adjust. And sometimes when it's doing that, hypoglycemia can result. RDS, which is called respiratory distress syndrome. This is huge too. So the higher the insulin level in the infant, and again, remember, they're used to making their own. The higher the insulin level, the decrease in surfactant production. Okay, and if you remember, surfactant is needed to keep the alveoli from collapsing so the babies can breathe and take in the oxygen. So very um, important to monitor these babies, not for just obvious things like blood sugar things, but also signs of respiratory distress. Nasal flaring, retractions, you know, pulling at their sides when they're breathing, having a hard time, increased respiratory rate, all that. And then finally, Another possible complication would be polycythemia, which is an increase in the number of red blood cells in baby, which is not good in an infant, especially because of jaundice. Okay, so a lot of these things for baby can lead to other things that we don't want. So there's complications from the complications, if that makes sense. So gestational diabetes. For mom, it's, you know, something that they can manage at home most of the time. Sometimes it's a lot more serious. I didn't put it on here, but there is a, uh, a small risk of having a stillbirth if you are um, a gestational diabetic. So very, very important that they have good glycemic control. And how are they going to get that? Good teaching and frequent monitoring. 
So that was my video on gestational diabetes. I could get like way more in depth than this, but I just wanted to be like, you know, a quick little video with like an overview of like the big key points, okay? Maybe later on I'll do another one where I get like really, really in depth in it. But this is the basic stuff that you need to know, okay? So need to know information for school, ATI, and NCLEX about gestational diabetes. I hope you found it helpful. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. And if not, I'll see you on the next one.